the sons of Japheth and the beast. We're going to start our study by starting with the book of Genesis. And uh, I wonder if you'd come with me to Genesis chapter 10. And to the story that we read there concerning the uh, sons of Japheth in their dis distribution across the landmass after the flood of Noah. In Genesis chapter 10, we're told this in the first verse. It says, Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And unto them were sons born after the flood. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, and Magog, and Madai, and Javan, and Tubal, and Meshech, and Tiraz. The sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, and Riphath, and Tagama. And the sons of Javan, Elisha, and Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, every one after his tongue, after their families in their nations. So here in the first stage of Genesis chapter 10, we have the first of the sons of Noah and his descendants enumerated, the sons of Japheth. Now the Japhethites, brothers and sisters, were the beginnings of the Indo-European races. And the Japhethites were known in history for their inventiveness and particularly for their exploratory zeal. And I wanted us to take up the words of the, of the second verse when it says that the sons of Japheth were Gomer and Mago, because here are the two oldest sons. So now, where did these two sons go or travel? We're told by Josephus, who says that Japheth the son of Noah had seven sons, who beginning at the mountains Taurus and Amanus, proceeded along Asia as far as the river Tanai, which is the river Don, and along Europe to Cadiz, which is just beyond the Straits of Gibraltar. Gomer, he says, founded those whom the Greeks now call Galatai, but who were then called Gomerites, whereas Magog founded the Magogites, who were by the Greeks called the Sivai. And so you'll notice that what our map shows here is the migration in a westwards direction of the sons of Japheth after the flood, both to the river Don, as shown on the right-hand side of the map, and then westwards along the river Danube, spreading into the very heart of Europe itself. That's what Josephus says. Herodotus says something similar when he says that the name Sivai was a name given by the Greeks to an ancient and widely extended people of Europe, who had spread themselves westward along the banks of the Danube. And finally, Diodorus Siculus tells us that he speaks of the Sivai, who were above the Galatai, extending to the Baltic. And so you'll notice, brothers and sisters, that what we're being told by most of these ancient historians is that not only did the sons of Japheth, Magog and Goma, migrate westwards into the heart of Europe, but they were in fact contiguous to one another. They settled on lands that were next to one another, separated in those days by the border of, of in fact, the River Rhine. So what then of the identity and the location of the other sons? Now, we may have a slight technical difficulty here. I, I, I seem to feel that the microphone is going to make a strange noise each time I walk across to the, uh, to the overhead projector. So I'm going to remain silent while I change the overheads, and, and I'll tiptoe back here before I start again. So the identity of the rest of the sun. So now here we have all of the family of the sons of Japheth as they're enumerated for us in Genesis chapter 10 and verse 2. We've got not only Gomer and Magog who spread across to the west, but we also have the third son in verse 2 who is Madai, which we believe answers to the area of Persia, because the word Madai in Genesis 10 verse 2 is the same word translated media, throughout the rest of the Bible, and answers to the Medo-Persian area. A Javan relates to the area of Greece, and the word Ionia, of course, has come from the word Javan. Tubal and Meshech, we know, relate to the northern section of the Moscovi 
and the Tobolsky. And I think, by the way, despite the fact that those words have been debated, that there is very good evidence in favour of those being the northern tribes of Europe. And finally, Tiras, which uh, is the ancient word for Thracia, which today we would say answers to the region of Bulgaria and Romania, extending up into the area of the Crimea around the borders of the Black Sea. So in brief, brothers and sisters, what would we learn from the settlement and the dispersion of the sons of Japheth in Genesis chapter 10? Well, it's simply this, that the Japhethites, the sons of Japheth, populated the European landmass. These are the European tribes. They settled in the European continent. And now I'd like you to come to Daniel chapter 7. Now, brothers and sisters, we remember how that in Daniel chapter 7 we have the enumeration of the four great beasts of Daniel and of Daniel's vision. And we're told that these four beasts in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 2, uh, sorry, verse 3, that four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from the other. And we've always assumed from that, and I think rightly so, that all of the beasts, therefore, of Daniel 7 are in some way related to the sea area of the Mediterranean. That part of their land territory was associated with the Mediterranean Sea. And we know what the four beasts are. We know that the beast of the lion is the power of Babylon. We know that the, that the beast that follows of the bear is the power of Persia. We know that the leopard is the power of Grecia, and we know that the fourth and terrible and dreadful beast is the power of Rome. Now what's interesting though about the fourth beast, brothers and sisters, well let me just go through that. <clears throat> so this is our standard interpretation, is it not, of Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7. That the four beasts of Daniel 7 answer to the four stages of the, of the image of Daniel chapter 2. Now the interesting thing about the fourth beast, the beast of Rome, there are two things that I think that we ought to note about it. The first is that it continues until the time of the end. Just notice what it says, by the way, in Daniel 7, verse 17. It says, These great beasts which are four are four kings which shall arise out of the earth, but the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever. Do you notice how that the kingdom and the saints and the establishment of the kingdom in verse 8 follows hard on the heels of the fourth beast of verse 17? There's no fifth beast, brothers and sisters. There never was, there never has been, there never shall be says Daniel chapter 7, verses 17 and 18. There are four beasts followed by the kingdom. So the Roman beast continues until the time of the end. That's the first important point for us to remember. And the second one is this. Is did you realize, brothers and sisters, that the fourth beast is European? Now, I'm just going to show you the location of the beasts. So now, if we come across the land mass and look at these four beasts in succession, on the right hand side you will notice that we have just a sliver of land coming down the area of Palestine which is coloured in that light orange which is the, west, the, the westernmost extent of the kingdom of Babylon. When we come to the Medo-Persian Empire, you'll notice that the green takes us a little further across through the area of Asia Minor, as it was called, and across the Bosphorus into the landmass of Europe, but only to a very small degree. When we come to the Grecian Empire, you'll notice that the red extra detail takes us a little further westwards again, but the Roman beast is essentially and especially and uniquely a Roman system, uh, uh, sorry, a European system. It's spread across the land map of Europe itself. And it's this beast, brothers and sisters, a European beast that continues until the time of the end. So, and now we come to the book of Revelation and chapter 13. Now, in Revelation chapter 13, we have, of course, a whole variety of beasts that are delineated for us, and we believe that the beasts of Revelation 13 are rightly related to the fourth beast of Daniel chapter 7. 
Actually, we can tell that quite easily because do you know that if you look at the cross references in the margin of Revelation chapter 13, you'll find Daniel 7, Daniel 7, Daniel 7, Daniel 7, turning up over and over and over again throughout the length and breadth of Revelation chapter 13. We're being told, brothers and sisters, that the idea of the beasts of Revelation 13 are drawn from a previous prophecy, which of course is Daniel chapter 7. Now, what do we have then in Revelation 13? Well, we've got four different beasts or powers enumerated. We've got the dragon of verse 2. We've got the beast of the sea of verse 1. We've got the beast of the earth of verse 11. And we've got the image of the beast of, uh, of verses 14 and 15. And I think that in Revelation 13, we have both the idea of sequential movement and also of concurrent existence. Now, let me explain what I mean. Do you notice how in Revelation 12, verse 17, it says, the dragon was wroth with the woman, so the dragon is in existence. And then chapter 13, verse 1 says, I saw the beast of the sea, I saw the sand of the sea, and a beast rise up out of the sea, and the dragon, verse 2, gave him his power. So I think that what we assume from that, and rightly so, is that the dragon in this case existed before the beast of the sea in order to give power to the beast of the sea. And likewise, in verse 11, it says, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, and he exercises all the power of the first beast that came before him. So there is some idea of sequence, isn't there, in Revelation chapter 13. And yet I think also that the symbols of Revelation 13 are to be treated as concurrent symbols. Because if the dragon of verse 2 gives power to the beast of the sea in verse 2, then we assume that both the dragon and the beast are alive at the same time. And if the beast of the earth of Daniel chapter 13 and verse, uh, verse 10 exercises power before or in the presence of the first beast in verse 12, then we assume that both the beast of the sea and the beast of the earth are likewise in existence at the same time. And if the beast of the earth has power in verse 15 to give life unto the image of the beast, then we assume that both the beast of the earth and the image of the beast are likewise alive at the same time. So, so what do we have then in Revelation chapter 13? What we've got, brothers and sisters, is the story of Daniel's fourth beast and the outworking of its history in Europe. So here's a chart that many of you might be familiar with that seeks now to essentially locate the beasts of Revelation chapter 13 in their relative positions upon the European continent. So we have the dragon of the east based in Constantinople, we have the beast of the sea, that is in the, in the westernmost portion of Europe, the beast of the earth to the north of that, and the image of the beast to the south of that in the area of Italy. Now, I'm only going to talk about the two beasts this morning, brothers and sisters, just the beast of the sea and the beast of the earth. The beast of the sea has relationship to things Mediterranean. And you'll notice that what the chart shows is that the beast of the sea was considered to be the Mediterranean countries, but especially France. France and the Latin kingdoms, which embrace the Iberian Peninsula. The heart of the, of the beast of the sea was in the territory of France. Now, France, of course, is Goma. So that's one of the sons of Japheth. Now, the beast of the earth of Revelation chapter 13 and verse 11 obviously comes from a different location because we're told that this is the beast of the earth and not the beast of the sea. And we believe that the phrase, the beast of the earth, in Revelation chapter 13 has reference to the landmass of central Europe and that the beast of the earth is essentially Germany and the Holy Roman Empire collaborating with the papacy. But if the beast of the earth is Germany, then that's Mago. So the remarkable thing about the beasts of Revelation chapter 13 is that one of them is essentially France or Goma and the other is essentially Germany or Magog, the sons of Japheth. We're at the very centre of the two beasts of Revelation chapter 13. 
And in fact, that's what happened, because historically, as we come through the history of Europe, we find that there were two mighty kingdoms that developed in parallel to one another. There was a kingdom called Neustria, which was centered in France, and a kingdom called Austrasia, which was centered in Germany. In their totality, these two kingdoms became the Frankish domain, but they were always separate in a sense. There was always a sense of division. Even when they were temporarily united together, as they were on certain notable occasions, they inevitably fell apart into two quite distinct kingdoms that relate to the territories of ancient Goma and ancient Magog. Of course, there was a man who united them together in his realm. Who was the man who brought together the two territories in his realm? And the answer is, of course, the man called Charlemagne. It was Charlemagne that ruled over both of them. And since the days of Charlemagne, there's always been a European dream for an empire that would combine the beast of the sea and the beast of the earth, a union of Magog and Goma, Japheth's older son. Now, I'm just going to take you now through some history from the time of Charlemagne onwards, just to see what happened in terms of, well, more particularly the Holy Roman Empire, but to see how that France and Germany were clearly seen to be two distinct units in the history of Europe. So then, here's our first map. Now, this is the Holy Roman Empire in the year 814. This is the year that Charlemagne died. Notice the extent of Charlemagne's empire. He combined together the beast of the earth and the beast of the sea. He ruled over the whole of France and the whole of Germany and the whole of Central Europe. His kingdom extended just a little southwards into Spain and southwards also into the Italian peninsula. And the two great centers of the Holy Roman Empire in Charlemagne's day were Arkham to the north, which was the civil or secular capital, and Rome to the south, which was, of course, the spiritual capital. But you see, that uniting of Goma and Magog that occurred briefly in the days of Charlemagne didn't last, brothers and sisters, because, well, let me show you what happened in subsequent history. Now we come to the time of the Holy Roman Empire in 1189. Now we've come to the death of Frederick I, Frederick Barbarossa, one of the greatest emperors of the Holy Roman Empire. Now, do you notice what's happened to the extent and size of the empire? It's shrunk into Central Europe. Where has it shrunk away from? It's shrunk away from France. It's moved away from France and moved eastwards into the whole area of Europe and perhaps a little beyond Europe itself. So there was a distinction emerging here between France, which would be in history a quite separate kingdom, and Germany, which would be the Holy Roman Empire. Because, of course, the Holy Roman Empire later became known the Holy Roman Empire of the German people. Oh, you notice the capitals changed as well. The civil capital has moved from Aachen now to Frankfurt. It's becoming thoroughly Germanic in its character. The spiritual capital is still Rome, but there's been a change. Well, let's move on a little first. So now we come to the death of Maximilian. We're another two or three hundred years later on in history. And you see what's happened now to the Holy Roman Empire. It's virtually completely moved out of France and is now thoroughly Germanic in its character, but also in its territory. And you'll notice how that the, 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 uh, the western border of the empire is virtually down the dividing line between France and Germany that we see today. This is the emergence of the Franco-German border, the ancient dividing line between Magog and Goma. It's been there for literally centuries, brothers and sisters. And notice that the capital's changed again. The secular capital has moved now from Frankfurt to Vienna. So you see the seat of the beast moved over time. Well, we know that it was the work and the responsibility of Napoleon to pour out judgments upon the beast and that, that Revelation 16 is largely the story of the work of the vials that the beast system of Europe might be judged. In fact, we might say that the beast came to an end with the dissolution of the Holy Roman Empire, which occurred in what year? Anyone know what year it was? 1806, absolutely correct. 
on the 6th of August, to be precise, if I remember correctly, because on that day the emperor abdicated his title as emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. And one could truly say that, in a sense, the beast system had come to an end at that time, 1800. And yet the remarkable thing is that the Bible, and particularly the book of Revelation, clearly tells us that there will be a beast system at the time of the end. So here are the references. The Bible requires a latter-day beast. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 11 says, And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in the image. But Revelation 14, brothers and sisters, is set at the time of the return of Christ and the preaching of the gospel to all the world that they should fear God because his judgments are coming. And yet the beast is referred to in Revelation 14. In Revelation 15, it says, I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire and them that have gotten victory over the beast and over his image. But Revelation 15 is the song of the redeemed at the time of the end. In Revelation chapter 16, it says, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet and they gather all together to the battle of Armageddon. But that's the time of the end, brothers and sisters. And yet Revelation 16 says there's a beast there at the time of the end. Revelation chapter 17 says, These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome both them and the beast. But that's the time of the end, is it not? And finally, Revelation chapter 19 and verse 20 says, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet, and these were both cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. But Revelation 19 is about the Lord Jesus Christ riding forth with his armies to do judgment upon the nations. But there's a beast alive, says Revelation chapter 19. So there's going to be a revival of the beast system at the time of the end. Now, where was that beast, brothers and sisters, in ancient times? And the answer is, well, it's a Japhethite beast. It dwells in Europe. It's lived in Europe all its life. Now, you notice that none of those passages tell us whether the final form of the beast is the beast of the sea or the beast of the earth. What thinkest thou? Which one do you think it might be, brothers and sisters, at the time of the end? Well, I'm going to suggest to you today that I think quite possibly it's going to be both. And I'll tell you why. If you just come to Revelation chapter 16 and verse 13. So this is one of these references that we've had to the latter-day beast. Now, let me just take you back to an earlier overhead. Do you notice that Revelation 13 talks about four powers? I'm going to ignore the dragon just for a moment, because the dragon is a separate story. Well, no, I'm going to speak about all four. The beast of the earth, the beast of the sea, the dragon of the east, and the image of the beast. Now, do you notice that those four symbols in Revelation chapter 13 become just three symbols in Revelation 16? Because Revelation 16 says in verse 13, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Only three. Four symbols in Revelation 13 become only three symbols in Revelation 16. So the answer is, of course, what symbols answer to what in these two respective chapters? Well, the first one's quite easy because is there a dragon in chapter 13? Yes. Is there a dragon in chapter 16, verse 13? Yes. So the dragon answers to the dragon. Why, yes. I think we can safely assume that to be the case. Now, the image of the beast of Revelation chapter 13, we believe that there is very good evidence for suggesting that that is the false prophet of Revelation 16. In fact, one of the things that ought to be noted concerning interpretations as to who or what the false prophet of Revelation chapter 16 might be is that whoever the false prophet is of Revelation 16, he was once the image of the beast of Revelation 13, and you need to explain the difference between the two and why his name has changed. 
Why does the image of the beast of Revelation 13 suddenly become the false prophet in chapter 16? Why the change of name? And why does his name change at the time of the vials? Whatever interpretation you might give to the false prophet, you must explain those questions. But I believe that the image of the beast of Revelation 13 answers to the false prophet of chapter 16 for certain excellent reasons that were outworked in the historical development. Now, what does that leave us in Revelation 16? Answer, just the beast. So what must that relate to of Revelation chapter 13? And I think the answer is the beast of the sea and the beast of the earth all rolled into one, brothers and sisters, at the time of the end. That the revival of the beast system at the time of the end of Revelation 16 answers to both the beasts of Revelation chapter 13. And if it is to be both, then it must include not only France and Germany, but they must be at the very heart of the system because they were at the center of the respective beasts of earlier days. The beast of the sea was France, the beast of the earth was Germany. If the latter day beast is a combination of those two, then we expect to see France and Germany at the very heart of the story in the latter days. What's interesting about that is that, do you know that 150 years ago we would have deemed that to be quite impossible? That France and Germany would collaborate together as a system of the revival of the beast in the latter days. 150 years ago. Where were we 150 years ago in history? Well, around about 1850, halfway through the 1800s. France and Germany were bitter rivals in those days. They were at war. 1870 was the Franco-Prussian War. There was tremendous conflict between France and Germany 150 years ago, brothers and sisters. You never would have imagined that it would be possible that France and Germany would be at the center of a revived beast in the latter days. But Christadelphian writers said so 150 years ago. When all appearances of the day were quite contrary to that conclusion. And of course it was said so, brothers and sisters, simply because the Bible indicated it to be so in Revelation chapter 16. I think that the possibility of a Franco-German beast was impossible a hundred years ago. In fact, I think it was most unlikely 50 years ago. Where were we 50 years ago? Emerging from the horrors of World War II. Did World War II involve the conflict of France and Germany? Oh yes. And yet the beast of the latter days, we believe, will be not only a European beast, but was to involve those two particular powers. Well, of course, the remarkable thing is that around about 50 years ago, a new force arose that began to confederate Europe. So after World War II, this is the face of modern Europe. It wasn't going to be Hitler, it wasn't going to be Napoleon, it wasn't going to be Bismarck that would be able to confederate Europe together at the time of the end. So what force, what mighty force arose that would bind Europe and particularly France and Germany together that there might be a latter day beast? And the answer is, well, of course, surprisingly, the most unlikely of things. It all began with a little organization called the European, now can anyone tell me what it was? Be careful now. The very first bringing together, the European Coal and Steel Commission, absolutely right. What was the European Coal and Steel Commission all about? And the answer was that because Germany had plunged Europe into war so many times, France said that Germany ought not to have control over the coal and steel resources of Europe with which they could build armaments to plunge Europe into war ever again. So France said, we shall own these resources jointly together. The resources, the industrial and Saar basins. And the European Coal and Steel Commission was established that they might combine those industries together, an alliance of France and Germany, so that there might not be war in Europe again. Well, you'll probably know, brothers and sisters, that what transpired after that was the Treaty of Rome in 1957 with its six founding state members, including France and Germany. But today I want to take you through another piece of legislation that I personally think has been crucial to the development of the beast in the time of the end. And it's this one here. Well, anyone like to tell me what they think it is? 
a piece of legislation that was signed on the 22nd of January 1963. The 40th anniversary of this treaty was celebrated exactly one month ago today. And there were celebrations. And there were celebrations in two places concerning the signing of this treaty. It's called the Franco-German Friendship Treaty, and it was signed on the 22nd of January 1963 by President de Gaulle and by Chancellor Adenauer. And they signed that treaty, brothers and sisters, to try and pledge that France and Germany would work together and that the enmities of the past which had divided them would be put aside forever. You know, know how old de Gaulle was in 1963 when he signed the treaty? He was 73. Pretty good guess. He was 73 when he signed. You know how old Chancellor Adenauer was? He was 87. Yeah, pretty good. These two old men, if you'll pardon that expression, brothers and sisters, because I say so with the greatest of respect. <laughs> These two, shall I say, senior statesmen sat down and signed a document together and after they signed the treaty they stood up and they embraced one another and they wept. And that treaty, I believe, has been one of the most important pieces of legislation that has governed the future of Europe for the last 40 years. Do you know that in that same year, just a short time later on, the Pope issued one of his most significant encyclicals entitled Pacem in Terrace, Peace on Earth. France and Germany had just signed a friendship treaty together. Well, let me tell you what that treaty does. Well, you can see from the, the chart here, it laid the framework for an unprecedented level of cooperation between the two powers. And since the treaty was begun, the terms and provisions of this document have been greatly increased and strengthened. So the heads of state of these two powers, France and Germany, meet together twice a year at an official summit conference. The foreign ministers meet four times a year, the defence ministers meet four times a year, but foreign ministry officials meet every month in order to prepare for those summit conferences. There is a, a defence and security council. There is an economic and financial council. There is an environmental council. There is a cultural council. There's a tremendous amount of cooperation has gone on between France and Germany as a result of the signing of this treaty. And a set of remarkable friendships has developed between the heads of state. What we do know, brothers and sisters, is that for the last 40 years, that treaty has proven to be highly resilient to leadership changes. Some of the most remarkable friendships have been Conrad Adenauer and Charles de Gaulle, who signed the document, who turned out to be good friends in the process, Helmut, Chancellor Helmut Schmidt and Valérie Giscard d'Estaing, of, of, who was the President of France of the time, uh, Chancellor Helmut Kohl and François Mitterrand, and now Gerhard Schroeder and Jacques Chirac, unlikely bedfellows, unlikely political companions, brothers and sisters, and yet they have cooperated together under the terms of this treaty in a remarkable way. I think perhaps we don't realise just how extensive it is. Do you know that Kohl and Mitterrand, between the years 1982 and 1989, when they were in power under the terms of this treaty, ought to have had 14 state summit conferences between the two of them. 14. That's two a year for seven years. That's the terms of the treaty. Do you know how often they actually met in those seven years? Heads of state meeting together. They had 80 meetings during that time. 80 meetings together. In the years 1982 to 1984, uh, the two foreign ministers, Genscher and Chaisson, had a thousand telephone calls together in just the space of two years. A thousand telephone calls. There is unbelievable cooperation between these two powers as a result of the signing of that treaty. Now, I think that our newspapers over our side of the world are probably not as informative as yours here, 
Uh, but we seem to notice on frequent occasions that our newspapers, when referring to things European, talk about the initiative of France and Germany, a Franco-German initiative. Do you get told that in your newspapers over and over again? That the whole driving process of European Union has been driven by Franco-German ideas. Well, it's all based on this particular treaty. So what's that treaty from a scriptural point of view? It's a Magog Goma document, isn't it? It binds two sons of Japheth together. The treaty established a requirement for Franco-German consultation on foreign policy, security and defense issues, and that the two nations strive to reconcile their viewpoints and seek a common position. In an extract from a Harvard paper on this particular treaty, uh, the paper says that the treaty crowned a process of reconciliation and irrevocably ended the times of Franco-German hereditary enmity. Well, so it did, brothers and sisters. And for the last 40 years, we've seen an acceleration of developments in Europe such as we've never seen before, principally as a result of this document and the outworkings of this treaty over time. It's driven by these two powers. So what we've got at the time of the end is this. The Bible said there would be a latter-day beast. And what we're suggesting, brothers and sisters, is that the beast has been revived by the sons of Japheth. And that the centrifugal force of European Union revolves around the Franco-German alliance. That this is the bringing together of Goma and Magog in order that that latter-day beast system might be seen. They are the ones that are driving this along. This is the beast of the sea and the beast of the earth brought back together in combination. I think sometimes, you know, we've had such a proliferation of wonderful signs in the European continent over the last 10, 20 years that sometimes we forget we forget, brothers and sisters, just how substantial the progress has been. So here's the last 10 years. Just the last 10 years. A decade of Magog Goma policy initiatives. Now these, by the way, are the dates that these things came into effect. Not the day they were debated, not the day they were mooted, but the day they finally came into force. 1993, the European Union Treaty came into force. In that same year, the single European market came into force. Who drove the Maastricht Treaty? The answer is France and Germany. Who mooted the single European Act in 1986 that came into force in 1993? The answer is France and Germany. In 1993, the European Monetary Union Agreement came into force. Who was the driving force behind the EMU process and documentation? The answer is France and Germany. In 1993, Eurocore was established, the Rapid Response Force that everyone knows is the beginnings of a European army. Do you know what the core of the Eurocore is? What the centre of it is? It's the Franco-German Brigade. A combination of French and German troops that have been collaborating together for years now under the Franco-German Friendship Treaty. In 1998, the European Central Bank came into existence, which was, of course, the precursor to monetary union. In 1999, the euro was launched. Who was it, brothers and sisters, that said, and rightly so, that the loss of one's currency is the greatest abandonment, and abandonment of sovereignty that a country could ever have. The giving up of one's currency. Well, it happened in Europe in 1999, as we all know. I was there, brothers and sisters, on the day of the changeover. I was actually in Germany on the day. And there were queues of people lined up at the banks to march in with their Deutschmarks and march out with their Euros. And the beginning of union was underway. The currency had been changed over. Who drove that whole process? Catholics. Indeed, the Catholics. But France and Germany were the greatest force to argue the launching of the euro. And now we come to 2002. Now, you might not see that, so let me just put it up. 2002. We have a blueprint for a European constitution. 
We have the merging of the European treaties, that which established the European Parliament and that which established the European Commission. We have the promulgation of the notion of a European president, which of course the Habsburgs would like to be an hereditary title, and that he should wear the crown of Charlemagne in the course of his presidency. We have the establishment of a European diplomatic corps and of embassies. That's all been mooted in 2002. You know, brothers and sisters, 20 years ago this was all unthinkable. Absolutely unthinkable. It's happened with such astounding speed. And every one of the initiatives on that particular overhead, brothers and sisters, came from two powers acting in concert together. Magog and Goma. They are all policy initiatives led by France and Germany. So this is what it looks like now. The key centres of the latter-day beast. You'll notice that in Brussels we have the European Commission, the European Council, the European Economic and Social Committee and the Committee of the Regions. Down below Brussels in the city and state of Luxembourg we have the European Court of Justice, the European Court of Auditors and the European Investment Bank. A little further down in Strasbourg, we have the European Parliament, we have the European Ombudsman, and we have the, the, uh, the location of Eurocore. And across in Frankfurt, we have the European Central Bank. So we might say that the capital of the Roman system, the beast of the latter days, has moved from Aachen to Frankfurt to Vienna to Brussels. It's alive and well. The fourth beast of Daniel is alive and well and living in Brussels. And you notice something interesting, brothers and sisters, about those three particular centres of European power. Brussels, Luxembourg and Strasbourg. You see where they all are? They all sit on the dividing line between Magog and Goma. They sit right down the middle, they straddle the ancient dividing line between Magog and Goma. This is the central system of the beast at the time of the end. And of course our expectation of these things was not just based on the book of Revelation. It was based on the book of Ezekiel as well. And that takes us back to our reading in Ezekiel 38. Now in Ezekiel 38, we have, of course, a very famous prophecy, well known to Christadelphians, about a confederacy of the latter days. We know that the term latter days is a phrase used in Ezekiel 38. <coughs> Just a couple of things of, of interest about Ezekiel 38. In verse 1, it says that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog of the land of Magog. That certainly seems to be what a number of other translations say, by the way. Gog of the land of Magog. That's what the revised ver version says. Uh, that's what uh, uh, Rotterdam's translation says. Now, do you know that Gog is the ancient name for a mighty leader of the Scythians? The Scythians, brothers and sisters, were Japhethites. The Scythians answer to Magog. So whoever, whoever this man is and whatever he leads, his title from ancient times is that of a leader of the Scythians or Japhethite tribes. And now we have the list of people that he rules over. And we'll all be familiar with the list of, of nations in Ezekiel 38 verse 2, verse 5 and verse 6. So let's just make reference to them. I've got a very old map here. And this old map tells us what the location is of, of the powers that are mentioned in Ezekiel 38. Son of man, set thy face against Gog of the land of Magog, the chief of Rosh, Meshech, and Tumul. We know that Goma will be there, and Tagama, and Persia, and Libya, and Ethiopia. All the nations in red, brothers and sisters, on this particular map, are the, are the particular powers that are joined together in the confederacy of the latter days of Ezekiel 38, verses 1 to 7. Now, there's two or three interesting things to know about that. The first is that in the list of nations that make up this confederacy at the time of the end, we have both Goma and Mago. You notice that, Magog verse 2 and Goma verse 6. So whatever this is all about, whatever the battle of Ezekiel 38 is all about, we know that it's to do with Japhethite nations. 
In fact, basically, it's a list of Japhethite people. Because you see, uh, Meshach is Japhethite, Rosh is Japhethite, Tubal is Japhethite, Tagama is Japhethite, Persia is Japhethite. That's Madai, one of the sons of Japheth, that settled in that area. The only non-Japhethite nations of Ezekiel 38 are Libya and Ethiopia, which, by the way, I believe are there by conquest and not necessarily by desire. So what Ezekiel 38 tells us is that the controversy of this chapter is a controversy of Japhethite nations. There's not one single Arab people, by the way, in sight. The Arabs are Shemites. The army of Gog and the people of the beast are Japhethites. Now that's a very old map, brothers and sisters. It's an old map because it's the same map that Christadelphians have been using for the last 150 years to expound latter-day prophecies. And even though it's an old map, it's a very good one. And we use it today, brothers and sisters, because we see absolutely no reason or need to change either lo the location of those countries or the basis of our exposition of Ezekiel 38. You know, there are two stages to the overthrow of that power. Christadelphians have taught for a long time that there are two distinct stages to the work of Christ and the saints in judging the nations. And I just want to draw your attention to this because I think it's useful to see the, the idea here. Do you notice how that in Ezekiel 39 verses 1 to 6 we have the destruction of Gog in Israel followed by fire being sent upon Magog. And then in Daniel chapter 2, we've got the image smitten on the feet first, and then secondly, ground to powder and blown away. In the book of Revelation chapter 14, we've got firstly the harvest of the grain, followed by two, the harvest of the vine. And in the book of Revelation chapter 16, we've got firstly the battle of Armageddon in vial 6, followed secondly by the fall of great Babylon in vial 7. Now, you see what we're saying here, brothers and sisters, in terms of the sequence of events. There's only two stages. There only, only ever has been two stages. No room for an extra battle here. Or an extra group of people that we want to fit in to an extra battle. So read all the top ones out together. The destruction of Gog in Israel is the same as the smiting of the image on the feet, which is the harvest of the grain or the battle of Armageddon. That's all one and the same battle, all one and the same controversy. The second stage is that the fire that is sent upon Magog is also the grinding of the image to powder that it might be blown away, which is also the harvest of the vine, which is also the fall of Great Babylon in vial 7. It's so very, very clear, brothers and sisters, those two stages that we've always understood in terms of the development of things at the time of the end. So we've seen a dramatic revival of the beast system. And we believe that what we're seeing in Europe today tells us that the final stages of God's purpose are near. So the question is, I suppose, and always is at such a prophetic day as this, well, what are our expectations for the future? What should we be looking for? What, what might we expect to see in terms of further developments in this area? Now, I'm going to give you a list, brothers and sisters, but I'm only going to give you evidence for one of the points because I'm going to suggest that excellent homework here would be for you to discover the proof for the balance of what I'm about to say. So here's the first thing. I think that we have a scriptural expectation that we will see the increasing dominance of Magog until it becomes the driving force of the European Union. That whilst to date it's been an alliance between Goma and Magog that has brought the beast system into being at the time of the end, that I think we expect to see Magog become a dominant force in the latter days. So some evidence for it. We're not just saying this, brothers and sisters, because of, of history. We're saying it because of scripture. We want good scriptural evidence, don't we, for each of these conclusions that we might draw. So here it is. Although Goma which is France and other Japhethite nations are associated with the Gogian Confederacy, 
Germany or Mago is clearly at the very centre of the controversy, as Ezekiel 38 verse 2 tells us. In fact, after the defeat of Gog in Israel, the judgments of God are turned upon Magog, says Ezekiel 39, as the primary force in the war which follows in Europe. And in Revelation chapter 20, when it talks about the post-millennial revolt of the nations, it's described in these terms that it's Gog and Magog all over again, says Revelation 20, as if that it harks back to this earlier rebellion of pre-millennial times as the great type of the last revolt against God. It doesn't say Gog and Rosh, notice, in, in uh, Revelation 20. It says Gog and Magog. It's like Gog and Magog all over again. So I think we can anticipate a continued increase in Magog's influence in Europe until it becomes the dominant force within the European Union. Well, here's some other things then. See if you can find the scriptural evidence for all of these. The increasing influence of Roman Catholicism in Germany or greater progress towards a Roman Catholic Lutheran reconciliation that there will be an increasing economic prosperity of the European Union that will establish a, a strong global position for the power of the Union. That there will be an increasing momentum of the European towards establishing a separate political entity that is distinct from the individual nations that it represents. And finally, that there will be an increasing likelihood of the member states to seek the militarization of the European Union rather than the development of their national forces. Now, I think there's good scriptural evidence for each of these things, brothers and sisters, in terms of future expectations that we might have in the European area. And now let's think about the most interesting thing of all, about all of those expectations. Not one of those needs to happen before Christ comes. We don't need to see any one of those, brothers and sisters, before Christ comes. In fact, I think that we've been so privileged to see the mighty signs that we have. None of these are set as a sign for the saints before the coming of Christ. I think it's more than possible that all of these are subsequent developments. We're privileged to have seen what we have, brothers and sisters. We can't have much time left before our Lord appears. Revelation chapter 17. In Revelation 17, it says in verse 11, And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. Remarkable phrase, by the way, it's used three times in Revelation chapter 17, is it not? The beast that was and is not and yet is. The beast that was and is not and yet is. You see, this is the story of the Roman beast in Europe through all the vices, vicissitudes of its career for 2,000 years of history. The beast that was and is not and yet is. This beast appears at the time of the end, and verse 12 says, The ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Do you think, brothers and sisters, that when Christ the Lamb comes, that those who are with him that are called and chosen and faithful, do you think they'll still be discussing who the beast is? Or who the beast might be that they're going to fight? I trow not, brothers and sisters. I trow not. Because we're told that those who shall gain victory over the beast know the number of the beast and the mark of the beast and the image of the beast and the number of his name and when the lamb comes, they shall rejoice to do battle with the beast because they've known who it is all along and they're ready for the coming of our Lord from heaven. Might it be, brothers and sisters, that when our Lord comes that we will be part of that glorious community who shall be with him to fight in that day. Prince of Peace, as one of our hymns says, let every nation soon thy law and scepter own. Bow the world in supplication. Bring the kingdoms to thy throne. 
earth possessing boundless blessing, then shall honour thee alone.